Hello moms. Hope that you are doing well. So you all are welcome to my YouTube channel. Level up your baby. In this video I am discussing about an important topic for our parents. Can you guess that? There is a number most unexperienced new parents cautiously watch after the birth of their newborns and that is their infant's weight. Yes, it's really really important point for our parents. Especially for our moms. Too much weight gain or weight loss can undoubtedly transform into a world of worry and stresses to our parents. Especially for new moms, it will be a reason to get depressed too while they are adjusting into the new situation with their new babies. So, average weight is a common concern for parents. However, what does average weight truly mean and what adds to normal weight loss and weight gain in newborns here i'm going to answer those questions and also let's clarify some uh, issues about baby's weight that is healthy feedings and regular poops how can it be an indication of Healthy weight. Most newborns lose a small percentage of body weight in their first few days after birth. As they shed additional body fluids they were brought into the world with. Then after uh, they started to pick up their normal uh, weight. Uh, it's about 4 to 7 ounces every week. And also remember that newborns weight relies upon many factors including gender, hereditary qualities, parental factors and especially mother's way of life during pregnancy. And also here I should tell you that most ideal approach to screen your infant's weight is by going to all planned pediatrician well visits. Although babies of the same age group can bear in their size and weight. So, I kindly tell to our parents, please don't compare your baby's weight with other babies. By doing that, sometimes you are getting an unnecessary stress into your mind. So please don't compare your baby with other babies. And also, weight is a good indication of their nutrition and physical developmental level. So, so it can therefore be helpful to know the average baby weight by age in months. Remember that the normal weight isn't equivalent to average weight. On the off chance that your child's weight is in null is in lower percentile it doesn't really mean that anything isn't right with their growth and development and their physical uh, physical development as as indicated by the who the normal birth weight for baby boys born full term is 7 pounds 6 ounces and the normal birth weight for baby girls is 7 pounds and 2 ounces most infants born at 37 to 40 weeks weigh between 5 pounds 8 ounces and 8 pounds 13 ounces as per March of Demis an infant who weighs under 5 pounds 8 ounces at birth has a low birth weight as I mentioned above some factors uh, some factors are there that contribute to your newborn baby's weight. Let's talk a few about that. First one is infant's gender. Especially boy, baby boys will in generally weigh more than girls at birth. 
but researchers they are really uh, unable to consider another thing is mother's weight if mother is considered as overweight for her height previously and during pregnancy especially it's not uncommon to have a heavier newborn on the off chance that mother's mother, that mother is underweight for her height at that point it's possible that her baby will be smaller than average another thing is hereditary qualities both parents past and current weight and well-being can add to their infant's weight and well-being and other thing is lifestyle throughout the pregnancy especially drinking and smoking uh, can badly affect it to the baby um, so drinking and smoking can be a cause to reduce the weight birth weight of their uh, babies and also especially mental development also can affect with that that factors other thing is mother's age younger mothers especially those in their teens will in generally have smaller child birth order also can have uh, effect with the baby's weight especially first born infants i mean eldest child in the family will in some cases they not exactly succeeding kids let's talk about newborn's weight loss as i said earlier a couple of days after birth babies normally lose around 5 to 10% of their body weight this is basically they lost additional body fluids after delivery which shouldn't be a reason for concern so our moms remember that you should not worry about the weight loss of your newborn in first week Within 7 days of birth fresh out of the box new children will begin pressing on their their ounces yet it wouldn't occur immediately remember that infants don't need a lot of foods at this time and also mother's breast milk is at um is as yet growing so don't worry if it takes that time to see this shade pounds to return What about newborn's weight gain? After the underlying weight reduction, infants begin to pick up between 4 to 7 ounces per week for around 4 to 6 months. Remember that formula contains a greater number of cal- calories than breast milk. So, formula fed newborns may put on weight somewhat more rapidly uh, than breast milk fed babies. You likewise need to consider growth spurts. infants will in generally have growth spurts after week 1 3 and 6 so don't be surprised if your beloved newborn desires more feedings around this time here are some instructions to our moms to monitor newborn's weight if you are a parent who's attend generally putting on infants on your bathroom scale you're not the first and you surely won't be the last said that this won't give desires reading of an infant's weight in light of the fact that these scales are not adequately dedicated to distinguish ounce utilizing the scale at your pediatrician's office during book to well checks is the most exact approach to gauge your infant's weight You can likewise think about your baby's elimination as a method of observing weight. After the first week, infants should have at least 5 to 7 wet diapers daily and 3 to 4 poops a day. Here breastfed babies may poop more than formula fed babies. In the event that your infant appears to be fulfilled during after and feedings, during and after feedings and seems alert after naps these are also signs that you are getting enough breast milk or formula for healthy weight gain and when to when to check uh, checking with your doctor if you have some trouble with your baby's weight yeah in the event that 
did your infants weight loss or weight gain doesn't caused by the common factors mentioned above it's important to check with your pediatrician right infants who appear unresponsive after waking up have some troubles in proper latching on the breast or bottle or uh, experiencing unexplained weight loss or weight gain should be evaluated as soon as possible well after weight this also a very important topic what is that infant sleep safety in the first few days of the journey after birth Babies follow a special behavior patterns as they face all sort of experiences and sensations unexpectedly. They used to spend most of the time for sleeping as they all do in womb. And also they are highly depend on their parents. It is suggested that children sleep on their backs which diminishes the probability of sudden infant death syndrome. we will we are saying sids since infants are on their backs throughout the night it's important for parents to keep them on their stomachs each day while awake we are calling this as tummy time and this way will help them to build the strength required for upcoming milestones like sitting and crawling start with a couple of minutes at once and gradually increase the duration first place the baby's face down on your lap or chest and then move to the floor zone thereafter most of their reactions are driven by primitive reflexes opposed to by intentional actions for instance touching the lip or cheek will probably make the infant show a rooting reflex where they are searching for food resources also as parents it is critical to know that love and affection is particularly important at this age as it will help create confidence and the feeling of security in this new place At the point when we are talking about newborn baby sleep we usually focus around frequent wakings feedings and sleeping training another significant topic however is sleep safety SIDS sudden infant death syndrome rates decline drastically after the back to sleep crusade however babies are still in danger they are also in danger of accidental suffocation and strangulation identified with sleeping conditions what are the precautions we can take to prevent sleep related accidents and uh, accidents among babies what do you think terrifying stuff fortunately you can make simple steps to greatly reduce your infant's risk of SIDS or sleep related accidents this is what specialists including the American Academy of Pediatrics AAP suggest for both nighttime sleep and naps before that let's talk about an interesting point that we talk about SIDS What is SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome? Are you aware about that as a parent? Yes, definitely you should. Because this is critically important point when we are talking about the sleeping of our babies. Sudden infant death syndrome also known as cot death or crib death. is sudden unexplained death of infant of less than 1 year of age this is usually occurs while sleep also the bad point is that the cause is still unknown but researchers propose that combination of few factors can affect with this situation so what we can do is 
to be aware of the factors and uh, make sure to prevent that points with our kids here especially environmental factors such as sleeping on tummy or side overheating and exposure to bad gases like tobacco smoke uh, can affect with the SIDS and another role role playing point is accidental suffocation from bed sharing and soft objects like soft toys pillows and other things other point is babies born be- before 39 weeks of gestation also are in risk of SIDS okay now let's talk about the f- uh, we talked about the factors what are what are the factors can affect with the uh, sids and now let's see what are the factors we can uh, get as the precautions for sids especially here abc abc's of the safe sleep we have to follow the uh, this method okay first one is a a means alone Babies should sleep in their own beds. What? Really? Yes, definitely. Your infant needs his own personal bed. Bed sharing. When infant used to sleep with parents or guardians in their beds, has numerous supporters. But the AAP says it's danger and advice against it when we are considering about sids on the off chance that you bring your baby into your bed for feeding at the night time keep him back into his crib when he is done in the event that you think you may fall asleep while feeding make sure that there is nothing in your bed that could cover his face head or neck and also nothing that may cause him to overheat like loose bed sheets blankets or pillows abc method b means back always place infants on their backs for sleep remember to keep your little one on his back in the crib while he is sleeping In 1994, the Back to Sleep campaign prompted the sensational diminishing in SIDS deaths. This might be because that back sleeping helps to prevent from rebreathing. Rebreathing? What is that? That means when the baby's face is squeezed against a sleeping surface and he inhales carbon dioxide instead of fresh air again and again if that happens continuously for a long time it can be toxic to your baby and it can be a cause to sids so always keep your infant on his back for sleeping jet on the off chance that he moves himself onto his tummy you don't have to reposition him as long as he most likely is aware how to roll the two different ways i mean back to tummy and tummy to back okay last point is c means crib an infant's bed ought to be a crib bassinet or portable crib with a firm sleeping cushion according to the safety standards in the event that he sleeps in a vehicle seat carriage or elsewhere that it's it isn't to the crib move him to the crib as soon as possible american academy of pediatrics suggests following recommendations for a safe sleep in babies rather than this a b c okay let's see what are those okay sleep in the same room as your baby k 
keeping your baby in the same bed with you is not recommended but sleeping in a same room with your baby for at least first six months of life may reduce the risk to have SIDS in 50% because you always alert about your baby you can feel uh, him and you can uh, and you can watch him so it's really important to sleep in the same room with your baby for the first at least for the first six months the only thing in the crib should be a sheet your baby and whatever he's wearing crib should have a tightly fitted sheets otherwise it can roll over baby and can interrupt with breathing in the event that you need to keep your infant warm, the AAP suggests a wearable cover or swaddling. But quite swaddling him when he begins attempting to roll over. Other soft objects including blankets, pillows, bumpers and soft toys may cover his face or be a strangulation danger. Other thing is avoid overheating your baby during sleep, right? You can feel their body temperature on their back or belly while they are sleeping because mostly babies can interrupt sleeping due to overheating. Your baby release body temperature mostly through his head so no caps or no head covers for sleeping. A cap could likewise tumble off and cover his face too so keep uh, away caps during sleep and also keep the room temperature agreeable for a lightly dressed adult and dress your child in just one layer more than you are wearing try not to stress if your child's hands feel chilly because that doesn't mean he is cold. To get a measurement of his temperature, accurate temperature, you should feel his back or tummy, right? Other important factor is to keep cords away from your baby's crib, especially especially electrical window or different robes that could fall or be pulled into your baby's bassinet are a strangulation hazards. Remember this in case, in case you are using background noise, fans, humidifiers or different machines. Definitely you should have awareness about that and keep away those things from your baby. Other thing is, and this is really important when we are talking about SIDS, offer a pacifier if you can. Is there any relation between SIDS and a pacifier? Is that good or bad? Yes, hopefully it's really good news uh, to say. Uh, offering a pacifier for the babies, it's really we can reduce the risk of SIDS for the babies. This is really highly recommended by AAP. In the event that the pacifier drops out of your child's mouth uh, while he is sleeping, you don't need to return it to. Okay? Remember that too. Other thing is breastfeeding. That's also really important as a pacifier. This also additionally connected with a reduced risk of SIDS. The AAP suggests breastfeeding or bottle feeding for uh, express breast milk at least one year for life. Even after the beginning of your child um, on solid foods, it's really important to keep breastfeeding during night time too to reduce the SIDS risk. Actually, now I guess you may understand the importance of tummy time and special factors to consider. A 
okay now let's move into another special important topic just like weight and sleep that is healthier attachment for happier future in children much like adults children are relational beings who seek out others for affection and warmth from the beginning they convey that they are trying to cultivate for a long time the parents sentimental link to the infant has been alluded to as a relationship that had occurred immediately this placed a lot of pressure on new parents who wanted a little more time to adapt to their new position of caregiver we now realize that the parent infant bond is really more of a marathon than a run the partnership phase or attachment is not going to happen immediately instead attachment is formed over the course of thousands of brief yet significant parent child experiences that occur as part of day to day caregiving treatment for the first year or two any changing in diaper every bottle of breastfeeding every soft touch these lead to attachment as such attachment can take several months to completely develop when we are talking about this topic there are some points to highlight for you good commitment is one of the best pre- predictors of a child's well-being it is created through thousands of positive parent child experiences also babies depend on a stable bond to survive it also acts as an emotional bond that meets the needs of both the parent and the child securely attached babies seek out mothers while they are uh, in pain without being to without being too reliant or clutchy parents can create these relationships by responding regularly in responsive and caring ways however children should also be granted chances to learn to be self sufficient as example just allow your baby to cry babies may be connected to more than one caregiver at the same time too well now let's see what is a safe attachment nearly 50 years of study on the subject have told us a lot about attachment forms and their lifetime benefits babies come into the pre-wired universe to realize that their life relies on others yet bonding is more than survival it's an intimate bond that satisfies the needs of both the adult and the infant it's often described as a dance because when babies have a solid stable relationship to their caregivers they are smooth giving and taking consistency that feels a fortless between them it's not to say that babies who are tightly attached never whine or scream but they do yet firmly attached babies are characterized by the way that they are comforted more comfortably in the company of their nursing caregiver they consciously seek out their caregivers while they are in pain without being too clinging or dependent on their parents as they mature they are able to explore their environments with confidence and to return as required for emotional attachment so as parents how can we support for the secure attachment parents who react sensitively and consistently to their infants put them on 
the pathway to secure attachment. The thought is that babies who regularly receive such care start to ascertain the planet as a dependable and nurturing place. They will then focus their attention on learning about the planet and their place in it rather than worrying with whether or not they are going to be nurtured. How can we know about uh, sorry, how can we know what babies experience once they feel this way? For many years, the strategy researchers want, want to study secure attachment was videotaping parents and their infants together under mildly stressful situations. Then observing the small moments of connection that occurred or didn't occur. Newer research uses cortisol, a stress hormone, to live to live a child's level of response. Interestingly, it's under moment of stress like separating from their caregiver, then returning, then reuniting, that securely attached babies show the clearest signs of healthy relationships. Usually, this is often shown to crying at same point, some point during the separation, then recovering well soon after the parent returns to comfort them and eventually moving on to happy play. Parents are often distressed once. Uh, parents are often distressed once they hear their infants cry once they are apart, but this is often actually a positive attachment sign. The baby is communicating that their secure base is out of their sight. What matters most is what happens next. Babies who feel safe within the world usually recover within the presence of others who will look after them. Their energy gradually returns to playing, feeding, or otherwise interacting with those around them. There's also a transparent difference in how, how calm and reassured they are within the presence of their parents or other primary caregivers. Compared to the reassuring presence of somebody less familiar to them. Even before verbally ready to say so, your baby is communicating, I feel better once I see you. I trust that you'll look out of me. Does this mean I want to reply to each whimper or risk attachment problems? No, not in the least. Attachment doesn't require to be at your baby's side every second. Some have some have misinterpreted misinterpreted attachment research to think that this is once the case often the case in fact the parent child relationship is supposed to be a balance between dependence and independence within the early months babies cry out for tons of reasons discomfort overtiredness and hunger are a couple of Parents got to be reasonably available to their baby's needs. But that doesn't mean that a baby shouldn't tend the chance to find out to self-comfort sometimes. In fact, that's a crucial skill for infants to find out over time. Parents across cultures differ in terms of how comfortable they are with letting their babies cry. They get tons of recommendations about the way to behave from relations and strangers alike about crying, spoiling, sleep routines and more and more. Know that the evidence shows that a good sort of parenting approaches may result in secure attachment. So as long as you are fairly consistent and nurturing together with your baby, 
you will develop a healthy relationship pattern that works for the both of you. Can babies have quiet one's attachment? The answer to the present experts agree is yes. This research should be reassuring to working parents who worry that prolonged absence from their infant may be a risk to a secure attachment between them. Babies can hold simultaneous secure attachments with adults who regularly nurture them. The key is to be fully present with the babies in order that you will truly read their cues. It takes practice to differentiate between a hungry cry and an overtired ones. It takes patience to snug, snuggle an upset infant and find out what works best, whether rocking, swaddling or humming. Or a mixture of all three, maybe. If your baby interacts with multiple caregivers on a daily basis it's key to speak what each of you has learned about your baby's temperament and which strategies work best to reassure her or him it's equally important to agree on which tactics and routines to implement this may teach the infant that the planet may be a predictable, comforting place which she'll be believing all of you to satisfy her needs when she is distressed. Finally, let's talk what are the advantages of healthy attachment. Studies show that an early healthy attachment is one among the strongest predictors of a child's well-being. Among the positive outcomes are children uh, who get older to be self-reliant, manage stress well, do better in class and from healthier relationships themselves. Right? So, certainly healthy attachment is that the goal all parents want all parents want for his a uh, home all parents wants for his a uh, her children and therefore the best chance to achieve it is to acknowledge that no single interaction goes to form or break the attachment but rather to plan to be being as responsive, nurturing and consistent you will be together with your infant. The dance you and your baby do together won't always be perfect, but your relationship will definitely enjoy your constant loving effort. Okay, let's move into the another topic. This is also very important for our parents. Common baby illnesses. Yes. Actually, we don't like to talk about this topic. Illnesses. We need our babies to be healthy forever. Yes, it is. But as parents... We should know the signs and symptoms and how to prevent the, these common illnesses and what are the medications, especially home remedies uh, we can take into before hospitalization. So let's talk about that. As a parent or caregiver, it can be easy to panic when your child is sick. We also strongly advised that you visit your pediatrician anytime your baby is affected by sickness. But it is also important to note that there are many common disorders that can affect babies. And many of them can be handled with 
over the counter or prescription drugs and or safe doors of TLC. Here's a rundown of some of the most common diseases that can occur in the first few years of the life. First one is respiratory issues. Respiratory infections also arise in the first year of life. In fact, one third of the hospitalizations that arise in the first year are due to complications in the respiratory systems such as cold, cough, measles, crop or RSV and especially bronchiolitis. These symptoms are most common during the cold and flu seasons but they will occur at any time of the year. First thing, first thing to talk about in respiratory tract is crop. This is refers to a viral infection of the upper airway that causes inflammation of airway and obstructs breathing. That may lead into a characteristic barking cough. Cough and other signs and symptoms of crop are the results of swelling around the voice box or larynx, windpipe means trachea and bronchial tubes that is called bronchi. When a cough forces air through the air, air through this narrow passageway, the swollen vocal cords produce a noise similar to a seal barking. Likewise, taking a breath often produces a high-pitched whistling sound calling as strider. Then, another topic is RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. This is usually serious causes that can affect in all ages, but especially this can harm, uh, this can cause to more harm to youngsters because babies airways aren't as well developed so they aren't able to cough up mucus as well as an older child symptoms of rsv include difficulty in breathing cough fever irritability runny nose and sneezing Using their chest muscles to breathe in a way that appears labored wheezing too. If not treated well, RSV can lead to other severe infections like pneumonia. In some cases, babies may need to receive treatments at a hospital. Other one is bronchiolitis. This is a common lung infection in young children and infants. It causes inflammation and congestion in the small airways called as bronchioles in the lung. This is almost always caused by a virus. Typically, the peak time for bronchiolitis is during the winter time. Bronchiolitis starts out with symptoms similar to those of a common cold but then progresses to coughing, wheezing and sometimes difficulty in breathing. Symptoms of bronchiolitis can last for several days to weeks. Most children get better with care at home. A small percentage of children require hospitalization in bronchiolitis. Next, let's talk about ear infections. Each parent and caregiver should be prepared for ear and ear infections in the first year. At first, an ear infection can be difficult to diagnose when you can't clearly see the infection. But sometimes it followed by fever and occurs on the heels of a cough. Ear infection can be very uncomfortable, so your infant can whine, squeeze or rub his or her ear, 
or display any signs of distress. Ear discomfort is a significant symptom of an ear infection. But it can also be caused by the strain of a cough or sinus infection. Or small ears may be affected by pain in the jaw while teething too. When the pediatrician decides, decides that you have an infection, antibiotics are generally administered. Another common topic, especially after starting weaning, but it's common in first few months too, is diarrhea and vomiting. Diarrhea and vomiting is normal in infants, but it's always never easy to watch them to go through it. One thing is for sure, anytime your infant gets diarrhea, you will know it is straight away. In comparison to the occasional loose poop, diarrhea is more watery, frequent and heavier than the daily dirty diaper. The same is true of vomiting. It's true that infants are sometimes spit up, but it's notably different when a baby vomits. You'll see that when he vomits, he's more strained and upset. Spitting up generally doesn't bother most babies, but it's going to take a toll on vomiting. Diarrhea and vomiting can be caused by bacterial infections, viral infections, food poisoning or food allergies or sometimes mostly due to food sensitivities. Often consult with the pediatrician if your child has diarrhea or vomiting but also keep an eye out for those symptoms of dehydration that can emerge from diarrhea or vomiting. Here are the symptoms of dehydration. Dark yellow color urine and urinate less frequently. Sunken eyes, lethargy, dry mouth, fever tears when crying, play less than usual. If your baby is in severe dehydration, here are the symptoms, very fuzzy, excessively sleepy, sunken eyes, cool, discolored hands and feet, wrinkled skin, urinates only one or two times per day. If you noted these symptoms with vomiting and diarrhea, immediately take, take him into your pediatrician for medical attention. Last one is the important one that is Diaper ash. Diaper ash is a common form of inflamed skin, we call it as dermatitis, that appears as a patchwork of bright red skin on your baby's bottom. This is also a common condition among babies who are wearing diapers usually. Diaper ashes mostly can occur due to caregiver's fault. So be aware about your baby's diaper changing. There can be a number of causes for the diaper ashes. Uh, it's including irritation from the stools and urine, chaffing or rubbing, irritation from a new product, bacterial or yeast, I mean fungal infection, sensitive skin of the baby when we are talking about the symptoms diaper ash is characterized by following some sort of skin signs such as red tender looking skins in the diaper region buttocks thighs and genitals Other sign is changes in your baby's disposition. You may notice your baby seems more uncomfortable than usual, especially during diaper changes. 
A baby with a diaper rash often fuses or cries when a diaper area is washed or touched. What are the preventions? The best way to prevent diaper rash is to keep the diaper area clean and dry and change the diapers oftenly. After you remove the diaper, remember to rinse your baby's bottom with warm water as part of each diaper change. Gently pat the skin dry with a clean towel or let it air dry. Don't over tighten diapers. Give your baby's bottom more time without a diaper. And also you can consider to use a regular ointment. It is still wise to contact your doctor when your baby feels pain or distress. But being conscious and prepared is the first step towards good health and a happier baby. Okay, after all there is another important topic to talk, that is tummy time. Well, what does tummy time mean? Can you guess? Yes, simply say when they are awake or alert, tummy time is the time your baby spends on their stomach. Simply enough it seems, right? Here we need to highlight the word awake because during sleeping time if you keep your baby in stomach it can cause for SIDS. You know the meaning of SIDS right? It is sudden infant death syndrome. The American Academy of Pediatrics AAP notes that growth can benefit from tummy time in brain and head, eyes, stomach, hands, legs and hips, back and neck. And also, tummy time encourages cooing and bubbling, rolling, sitting up, crawling and walking, like developmental milestones do. As soon as the new baby's arrival, you can start to practice this. After diaper change, the AAP suggests 2 to 3 minutes a day for first time and then more time can add it gradually with the response of your baby. To help babies to adapt the tummy time, they suggest few positions of tummy time so that can be more comfortable for your infant. The Back to Sleep Initiative was launched in 1994 proposing that children sleep on their backs to decrease the risk of sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. The SIDS incidence over 50% was significantly reduced by What do the motor relays have to do with back to sleep? Since babies spend so much time on their backs, usually 12 to 16 hours in the early months, they skip some basic growth that used to happen in their stomachs. And it's up to parents to ensure that when they are awake, those babies spend time face down. The American Academy of Pediatrics AAP advises putting children to sleep on their backs and playing on their tummies while they are alert and awake. In several health and development related fields, beginning with a few minutes from birth may have long reaching impacts. Let's take a glance at the advantages of this. First one is brain and head. What are the advantages 
related to brain and head due to tummy time yes there are some first one is help to prevent cranial asymmetry called as flathead or plagiocephaly which the baby may treat with helmeting to get back symmetrical shape of their skulls and also increases spatial perception in the body enhances sensory integration uh, one benefit of this can be to decrease meltdowns due to overstimulation and supports cognitive developments second one is eyes enhances hand eye coordination in infants and supports visual motor depth perceptions when considering their arms improves the strength and the ability to reach helps to prepare arms for crawling let's consider about the tummy reduces constipation gases and slows gi motility gastrointestinal motility too then when talk about hands increases strength of hands and support independence considering legs and hips tummy time helps to enhance flexibility strength and the mobility of their legs and hips and helps to prepare for crawling um, back and neck prevents torticollis that means atypical position of head and neck which may require phys phys physiotherapy and strengthen the shoulder back and neck crucial to reach future gross motor milestones and improve posture okay there is a lot of advantages but does tummy time encourage my child to crawl grab toys and eat do you have any questions about that during the first year of life here are a few developmental skills that babies acquire bubbling and cooing reaching and grasping a toy rolling eating sitting up with the help of abdominal muscles crawling in all fours walking they all have one thing in common are you able to guess what is it they all need muscle strength on the front side of the body known as flexors as example muscles of the head and mouth neck quadriceps stomach and hips to do various activities um, by pushing against gravity babies strengthen their muscles the most effective way to practice this is lying face down in areas ranging from talking and grasping to crawling and walking babies who don't spend enough time on their bellies also have delays well let's see when to get started and how much time do you need to keep your babies in tummy as soon as your little one comes home from the hospital tummy time will begin after every diaper change in every day you can start by simply putting your child on their tummy for a few minutes aap suggests tummy time with more time progressively added two to three times a day for three to five minutes each time from the birth around 20 minutes per day is recommended and start slowly be careful and be aware don't ever let your baby alone in this position the goal is to increase the duration of each tummy session 
to 10 minutes, 4 or 5 or more times per day. Researchers show that babies who spend at least 80 minutes per day awake on their tummy are more successful in achieving those motor milestones earlier than babies who spend less time on their tummy. There are some different positions for tummy time. While it seems like a lot for 80 minutes, you would be surprised how easily the tummy time adds up over the day. In order to make things more enjoyable and entertaining for your baby, there are some activities to do while in the tummy. To help your baby to adjust, you can also alternate various tummy time positions, just like tummy to tummy, uh, tummy down carry or football hold we call. Lap prone or eye to eye. Tummy to tummy means put your baby on your chest or tummy and lie down so you are face to face. Tummy down carry or football hold means place one hand under the tummy and between the legs and carry the baby face down. In lap prone position, put your baby face down on your lap. Eye to eye position means bend over into your baby so you are at the level with your baby. Provide extra protection by putting a rolled up blanket under the chest and shoulders of your baby. Each minute your child spends on their tummy will make a difference. But still you have done a lot of tummy time with your baby and there are some issues that they are not reaching their goals at the proper age limits. Bring your questions to the pediatrician or healthcare provider of your baby and clarify it as soon as possible. 